Hello and welcome everyone to this video podcast for evolution and diversity. In this video podcast, we're going to talk about other mechanisms of evolution. We've talked quite a bit about natural selection up to now, and we've introduced these other mechanisms like genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation, but we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about those today. Before we get into those other mechanisms, I'm going to spend a little time talking about fitness trade-offs. Then I want to talk a little bit about which of these mechanisms here of evolution, including natural selection, are random. What affects genetic variation amongst these different mechanisms? And why is it that only natural selection leads to adaptation, whereas these others do not? Okay, let's go ahead and get started with our first objective. So before we move on to those other mechanisms, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about fitness trade-offs that are associated with natural selections and adaptations. Before I define what a trade-off is and provide some examples, I want to remind you of two points. And the first one is that adaptations increase fitness. But no adaptation is perfect. When we think about adaptations, we have to remember that there is a restricted time and energy. So what I mean by this is the energy that it's going to cost the organism to make or maintain that adaptation isn't worth it. Or another way we might think about it, is it a good trade-off? Whatever energy I'm going to spend into making this particular adaptation, is it worth that energy loss? So what is a fitness trade-off? If you want an analogy, you can think about a car. You don't see a lot of large cars that are fuel efficient because it's hard to make a car that is both big and fuel efficient. It's a trade-off. You either want a big car or you want a fuel efficient car. So let's define what a fitness trade-off is. It's a compromise between two traits that cannot be optimized simultaneously. So let's think about what I just wrote here. Remember that when an ad adaptation occurs, it's because a particular allele is found in that population that will provide that particular adaptation to allow that organism to be more fit and produce more progeny. However, by selecting one allele that gives you that one adaptation, there may be some sort of trade-off. So let's talk about some examples. And we've talked about some of these before. We didn't really talk about them as trade-offs, but they are. My first example I want to talk about is the example we talked about a couple days ago with malaria and sickle cell disease. In this process, alleles were selected that protected individuals against malaria. However, the trade-off was that those same individuals were now at a risk of developing sickle cell disease. Bright colors in many male species. So this, as a result, will increase their chance at reproduction. But the trade-off is that it also increases their chance of being eaten by a predator. That's the trade-off of some birds, like peacocks, having bright colors, the males anyhow. Turtle shells, a large, thick shell. This results in greater protection, and I would use an up arrow to mean greater or increase protection, but lower speed. Likewise, a smaller shell and thinner one is less protection, but greater speed. In some environments, the top one might be preferable, and in other environments, the bottom one might be more preferable. And in some environments, you might pick something in between the two. Okay, I'm going to give a, a few more examples here. We know that lizards, there's a trade-off here as well. We know the more eggs they produce comes at a cost of a decreased immune system. So if a, a lizard makes a lot of eggs, the risk is they're not going to be able to fight off infection. Too few eggs, they can fight off infections, but they don't produce as many eggs. And so from an evolutionary perspective, they don't pass their genes on as effectively. Something in between might be more desirable. Similarly, we see this in crickets too. So in crickets, in males, a thick 
sperm pack, which is where the sperm are located during reproduction. So when it's a thick sperm pack, you have increased reproduction. I'll just abbreviate that but a decreased immune system. And I'm just gonna put IS for immune system. A thinner sperm pack is the reverse. Less ability to reproduce, but an increased immune system. In both these cases, it's all about energy. Female lizards put a lot of energy into making eggs, and at the expense of that energy, the immune system is compromised. Same thing with male crickets. The amount of energy that they put into that sperm packet, that energy is now lost to develop an effective immune system. These are trade-offs. And the last one I wanna talk about our salmon, lots of energy. I'll put three arrows here. Lots of energy in order to spawn. S swimming up the river, they finally are able to spawn, reproduce, but it, it comes at an expense of their life. So all that energy is put into reaching the place to be able to reproduce, to spawn, comes at the expense of their life. That's a really tremendous trade-off that evolution has selected. I suspect the, the salmon didn't have a vote in this, right? maybe they didn't realize what they were giving up. So when we think about these trade-offs, we can kind of think about them in this summary of life history strategies. On this side here, I'm going to say high fecundity, and I want to introduce that word to you. And this just means the ability to have progeny. So high fecundity means a lot of progeny. Also on this side, I'm going to put a decreased survivorship. Other organisms might have the other extreme here of a lower fecundity, but that comes with an increase in survivorship. So organisms that have increased fecundity and lower survivorship typically produce many offspring. These offspring are typically small. They reach maturity early. They typically have a small size. They typically will have a low disease resistance. They have a low predator resistance. And they have a short lifespan. Organisms with reduced fecundity and increased survivorship, they're gonna have the opposite of these. They're going to have few offspring. And these offspring will be larger the age of maturity is later. So I'm gonna say late maturity. And when I say maturity, I'm talking about sexual maturity. At what age do they reach the stage where they can reproduce? They're gonna be larger. And they're gonna have high disease resistance and high predator resistance. And lastly, they have a longer lifespan. What I would like you to do on your own is to think about different organisms that would fall under the category here on the left and different organisms that would fall under the categories here on the right. And maybe some organisms that are in between. Now remember a couple podcasts ago, we talked about some of the mechanisms of evolution. We talked about natural selection. We talked about genetic drift. We talked about gene flow. I think we talked about it in specific examples with migration. And then we talked about mutations. Now natural selection, we've spent quite a bit of time on. And the other three I introduced to you, but I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about each of these last three here. Okay, so let's spend a little time talking about genetic drift. Genetic drift is defined as a change in allele frequencies in a population due to chance. Some features of genetic drift include allele frequencies drift, so to speak, up and down randomly in respect to fitness. All right, so what do I mean by this statement here? Remember with natural selection, we also see a change in allele frequencies, but it's not random. Certain alleles are selected because they lead to some favorable adaptation. With genetic drift, allele frequencies change, but it's completely random. Why some alleles remain and some are lost is due to chance. And we'll talk about some examples in a moment that, that will make this a little bit more clear, I think. Genetic drift 
it occurs in every population in every generation. Sometimes this drift might be due to a very noticeable event like a hurricane or a typhoon. In other cases, the thing that caused the drift might not be as easily noticed, but it occurs in every generation in every population. Genetic drift can lead to random loss or fixation of alleles. When the allele frequency changes because of genetic drift, sometimes that can eliminate over time one type of, a, of an allele. It may also predominantly favor another allele so that it becomes one of the main alleles in the population, which is what we mean when we say the fixation of alleles. Now all of these things that we're talking about here are more pronounced on small populations. While drift still has an effect on a large population, it's less noticeable. You're less likely to see a random loss or a fixation of alleles from a large population. A small population, this is going to happen, losing alleles and fixing alleles, at a much more rapid rate. There are two main causes of genetic drift that we're going to talk about today. The first is called the founder effect, and the second is called genetic bottleneck. Okay, let's first talk about the founder effect. And this is defined by when a group of individuals immigrates to a new location and establishes a new population. So let's consider the beetle population that we talked about a few lectures ago when we were talking about natural selection. And in this beetle population, it has many more red beetles present than the other colors, blue, green, and orange. But we do still see that variation within this population, even though it's mainly red. Well, the founder effect would say if a small group of these individuals left this larger population and moved to a new location and founded a new population. So let's just say that we're going to take this small group here and they're going to leave this main group here for whatever reason. We don't know why. Maybe they didn't like the beetles over here and they were like, hey, we want to live on our own. And so they left. And so you can see in this new small population right now that there are no alleles that led to the red color. And we see orange, blue, and green. And over time, one might predict that these numbers will increase. And so you can see how the allele frequencies have changed from this population here, the original larger one, to the smaller one then, which grew into a slightly larger one. And the thing that might jump out at you is, A, there's no red ones over here on the right. And the frequency of the alleles, the green ones say, the orange ones, and the blue ones are higher in this population than over here. And since we're making this up, we can just kind of add to the story. So let's say this green beetle here had an increased chance of some sort of beetle disease. In this population over here, it was such a rare occurrence that it really didn't affect the population too much. But now over here, because of this founder effect, this green beetle, which has some kind of negative impact on the population, is now much more predominant. This population would have sort of held it in check because of its size, but now this smaller population, we have many, many more beetles of this green variety that has this particular beetle disease. And that's because of the founder effect. Small population from the large group moves over, and now those alleles can, will change in frequency. And remember, on the last whiteboard, I said we will lose some alleles in this process, and we lost the red alleles, and some alleles will become fixed, meaning they will become the predominant one. Now, we really haven't seen anything get fixed yet, but maybe after many, many more generations, one of these alleles will become fixed in this population. There's a lots of examples of this in the real world, not just this beetle world I, I made up here. And I wanna talk about one in particular. And it centers around this disease called Ellis Van Creveld syndrome. Individuals with this syndrome, they have shorter arms, shorter legs, they have a narrow chest, and, and the ribs are smaller. And so ultimately this leads to someone with a much shorter stature. And then there are other traits associated with this syndrome. One of them you can see on this picture here, and it's called polydactyly. And you can see, looking here, this individual doesn't have 
the standard five digits on each hand or foot. You can see over here on this hand there are six fingers and over here you also have six fingers. This foot here has five toes but this foot over here has six toes. We'll talk about polydactyly when you take genetics but for now you should just know that it produces individuals with different numbers of fingers and toes. Now this syndrome here in the in most parts of the world it has a very low incidence about one in every 60,000 or 200,000 individuals depending on the population that you're looking at so it's very rare however in some Amish communities it is much more common in fact in these communities about 12.3 percent of the members of these communities are heterozygous and remember when I say heterozygous that means that one of their alleles has no mutation but the other allele does so these 12.3 percent don't have the syndrome but they can pass it on to progeny and this leads to a much higher incidence of this syndrome in these communities compared to other communities around the world well how did this happen well it turns out that in around 1744 approximately 200 Germans immigrated to Pennsylvania. One of these individuals, his name is Samuel King, is thought to have been a heterozygote for this syndrome, meaning he didn't have the disease, but he was, say, plus minus for this syndrome. So he was able to pass this mutated allele onto his progeny. In fact, every individual in the present community that has this syndrome can trace their ancestry back to Samuel King. And that's because you took a rather small portion of Germany, right? Just 200 individuals. And they came to America and they settled in Pennsylvania. And because a very small percentage of those people in that 200 individuals, just one, had a mutation, it now became much more predominant in this community than it would have been seen back in Germany. So this is a real example of how the founder effect can lead to allele frequency changes in populations. That is, it can lead to evolution, not by selection, but by this other mechanism of genetic drift. Okay, let's talk about the second way that genetic drift can happen, and that is by genetic bottlenecks. So what do we mean by a genetic bottleneck? Well, let's start with a simple analogy of the general idea of a bottleneck. If you took a two liter empty bottle of your favorite soft drink and you emptied it and you filled it up with a variety of marbles and then you took that two liter bottle and you flipped it over so marbles could come out. But they're not going to come out real fast. In fact, if you only flip it over there say for like 10 seconds, maybe let's just say five marbles fall out. That's what we mean by a bottleneck. You have a large population, the original bottle of marbles, but only a few can slip through the opening of the bottle, the bottleneck. Those few that drop through, that's all that's left. And that is all that will remain from that original population of marbles. Now if these marbles were beetles or some other kind of animal or plant or microbe, those that made it through that bottleneck would be the only ones that could reproduce and make new progeny. So now let's move to something more specific and define what a genetic bottleneck is and then we'll talk about some examples. So what is a genetic bottleneck? Well it's when a large population ex experiences a sudden reduction in size which results in a reduction of allele diversity. So let's consider our now world famous beetle population here. And let's say something happens to this population. Maybe a, a forest fire, maybe some sort of flood, maybe some sort of drought. Something happens and we lose a large portion of this population. So in this example, the disaster that's going to happen to them is what is commonly known as, a, as an eraser. And so after this natural disaster, we only have this many members left. And over time, just like we saw with the founder effect, over time, 
we will see this population grow. And remember that previous population was predominantly red. And some red individuals did survive, but it looks like more blue and orange individuals survived. So the allele frequency certainly has changed from this original population to the one we see now. And just like we talked about when we talked about the founder effect, it's possible then, say, this orange allele here is associated with some sort of beetle disease. And now that it is more common in this population, this population is going to have an increase in that particular beetle disease compared to the original population where there weren't that many orange beetles. In this population, there's a lot more orange beetles proportionally. That change in allele frequency is leading to evolution. Again, not by selection, but by genetic drift. So let me talk to you about a real world example of genetic bottlenecks. So on this island shown here, and it, this island's called Pingelop Atoll, it's a small island in the South Pacific. And we know that before 1775, back when I was just in high school, there were thousands of inhabitants. Then, in 1775, a typhoon came along and it hit the island. Out of these thousands of inhabitants, only approximately 20 individuals survived. That's a huge genetic bottleneck. They lost a huge proportion of the humans on this island and also other animals on this island and other plants on this island. And so this island actually has turned out to be a very interesting island for evolutionary biologists and geneticists to study because of that. But let's talk about these 20 survivors for just a little bit. It turns out that one out of 20 individuals on this island have a disease called achromatopsia. This disease leads to blindness and before they go blind they are colorblind. So one out of 20 people on this island have this condition. In the general population all around the world it's, it's usually about 1%. So I'm going to say general population. So why is it that so many more people on this island have this syndrome of achromatopsia? It turns out of those 20 people who survived, one of them had this syndrome or was a carrier of this syndrome and was able to pass it on to their progeny. It was just luck. It was just by chance, which is the, the hallmark of genetic drift. It was by chance that one of those 20 individuals happened to have the mutation that is the allele that led to achromatopsia. So that's how a genetic bottleneck can lead to allele frequency changes but doesn't lead to ad adaptations. There's nothing beneficial about having this particular mutation. So it wasn't selected for. It's just what was left after the typhoon. As a quick take home point about genetic drift, I want you to remember that it does not lead to some sort of selected adaptation. This is not natural selection. It's a change in allele frequency, but these are not traits that are being selected for. And the only way you can fix this problem that was caused by either a genetic bottleneck or the founder effect is through gene flow. So I'm just gonna put that down here. Gene flow can fix genetic drift or the impacts of genetic drift. And we're going to talk about gene flow next. And then you'll be able to see how this can increase genetic diversity. Okay, so let's now talk about gene flow. And we'll talk about how gene flow might be able to help some populations that have experienced some kind of genetic drift. In general, when we think about gene flow, what, what we really are saying is allele movement. But we're kind of stuck with the term gene flow because that's the way we describe it in textbooks and in scientific literature. But it's really about the movement of alleles from one population to another. So let's give gene flow a definition. It's when one individual leaves one population, joins another population, and then breeds within that new population. So when this happened, we would say gene flow or allele movement occurs. Now I want to draw my beetle population again, the one that resulted after the genetic bottleneck. And I forget what it looked like, so I'm just going to make a guess here. But I remember there was maybe more orange alleles, there were some blue ones, green one, red ones, and some green ones. But if you remember, the original population had a lot more red individuals. 
And remember, the orange alleles were not very predominant in the other population, but are more predominant in this population. And the downside of that was that the orange alleles resulted in a particular disease to the beetle. So one way we could restore this and, and help these poor beetles out so they don't have a higher proportion of beetles with this disease is we could have individuals from another population move to this population, immigrate to this population, and introduce those new alleles. Let's say we have over here a population of red beetles, all red beetles. Well, they're going to move over here and they're going to start mating with these beetles. And over time, you will end up with a population that's going to have more red beetles. You're still gonna have some orange beetles, but they're not going to be the predominant one because of the gene flow coming from this population that is all red beetles. So by doing that, we've increased genetic diversity and decreased the impact of the disease on these beetle populations. Now remember, I talked about how genetic drift decreased allele frequencies. Gene flow doesn't decrease allele frequencies, but rather it equalizes allele frequencies. And that means that we're equalizing gene frequencies in both these populations. And so I didn't talk about that yet, but we'll have orange beetles also moving over here to this population and mating with these red beetles. We'll have green beetles doing the same thing, and we'll have blue beetles also doing the same thing. And the end result is that Given no selection, meaning there's no selective advantages, these two populations will equalize and will look very similar to each other based upon allele frequencies. So both populations experience gene flow in this example here. So in general, gene flow is really important in the genetic stability and the genetic diversity within populations. We know it's important because when it's blocked, it can have devastating effects on populations. So for instance, let's just draw two populations here the red and the blue population, so to speak here. And over time, right, they gene flow occurred between both of them and it made both populations more stable. And you ended up with some of the red traits over here and some of the blue traits over here. Now what happens sometimes is a barrier now may be placed in between these two populations. It could be a natural barrier, but what we see more and more today is a human made barrier. So let's put a road between these two populations. And this road now will prevent these two populations from moving from one to the other, therefore decreasing gene flow and decreasing genetic diversity in both populations because they won't be able to share the alleles between these two populations. This is called, when you build something in between two populations like this, we call this habitat fragmentation. And I'm sure when you take ecology, you'll talk a lot more about this. But habitat fragmentation will take large populations, interbreeding populations, and they will split them so they can no longer breed. Over time, it can lead to speciation as well, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. So up to now, when I talked about gene flow, I talked about how it's really good for genetic stability. But is that always the case? Let's talk about an example with steelhead trout. So let's do this here. Let's draw a pond or a lake. We'll call it a lake. And in this pond, pardon my excellent drawing of fish, let's say there are this type of fish that we're gonna call wild steelhead trout. At one time, this lake was full of steelhead trout. And due to various activities, the number of steelhead trout has dramatically reduced. And so what we did in our infinite wisdom is that we built a fish farm. And in this fish farm, we raised steelhead trout. And I'm gonna make them a different color just so I can distinguish them from the wild ones. So in this environment here, they were very effective at breeding them. They were able to get a lot of steelhead trout and they could use these for various reasons. They might sell them. But what they really wanted to do at some point was to repopulate this lake so there would be more steelhead trout here. Maybe for fishing or for whatever reason, we wanted to get more steelhead trout here. And every now and then what they would do is they would take a few of these steelhead trout from the farm and introduce them. So essentially what they did by taking these fish and putting them over in the wild population is they artificially allowed gene flow to occur. So let's call these blue ones here, we're gonna call them captive steelhead trout. 
because they were the ones in this farm, they were captive in this farm. And so this seems like a really good idea. What they've done is they've added more genetic diversity in this population here. And now what you would expect is over time that this population would recover and you would have a lake full of steelhead trout so you could go there and you could fish with your family. But scientists wanted to check and see if that prediction was true. So this is what they did. They captured a large portion of the steelhead trout in this lake and they analyzed them using various genetic tools and then they released them back into the lake. And these genetic tools allowed the researchers to determine if progeny were the result of two wild steelhead trout mating and producing this purely wild steelhead trout or if the progeny were the result of two captive trout mating to produce the progeny. And they were also able to determine if the progeny resulted from a mating between one wild steelhead trout and one captive steelhead trout. And I'll cleverly draw it like so. And by seeing how effective wild steelhead trout were at reproducing and compared that to how the captive steelhead trout were reproducing, they could determine the relative fitness of the wild steelhead versus the captive steelhead. And what they were able to determine is the relative fitness of the progeny. And so we're going to put fitness on this axis here, and we're going to put the different fish matings on the horizontal axis. What they discovered then was that the relative fitness of the wild times wild steelhead trout, that is the progeny that resulted from when a wild type steelhead mated with another wild type steelhead trout was that their relative fitness was very high. They also showed that the fish that resulted from a wild and a captive steelhead trout also had fairly decent fitness but not quite as good as the wild times wild. And what perhaps surprised them when they did this study is that the relative fitness of the trout that were from the captive trout matings had a much reduced fitness, about half of that of the wild type. So while in natural habitats, gene flow is very advantageous and it does increase genetic diversity and stability in populations. It turns out though that artificial gene flow in this study showed that genetic diversity will actually decrease because the captive fish are less fit. So artificially, Gene flow was not a success in creating more genetic stability in this, in this uh, lake of trout. An example of something that looked good on paper perhaps, but when you actually studied it and analyzed the results, it did not match the prediction. There must have been some other trait in these captive steelhead trout that reduced their fitness in the natural environment, which I guess in retrospect is not that hard to imagine. Now, as we end our discussion here on gene flow, one thing I want you to think about is, does gene flow occur in human populations? Do you see examples of gene flow in human populations? What's the result of that? All right, the last evolutionary mechanism that we wanna talk about are mutations. Let's begin by just providing a simple definition of a mutation. These are any permanent change in the hereditary material which is of course usually DNA. The only time we see RNA as the genetic material is in some viruses. We're gonna talk about a few types of mutations in just a moment, but I wanna point out a few reasons why mutations are so important in evolution. Probably the most important is that they're the ultimate source of genetic variation. Another way of thinking about this is that it's the only source of new alleles. Next is that without mutations, evolution would eventually stop. Because they are the source of any new alleles that are going to enter into a population. They are random, mutations are random in respect to fitness. Sometimes a mutation can occur and it will be a benefit to that population. Other times, a mutation could occur and it is a detriment to the population. Most often, mutations occur and 
they are rather inconsequential. Mutations don't occur because the organism wants them to occur. Mutations exist in a population, and that's kind of the toolbox that evolution has to work with. If an organism, say, needs a mutation in order to survive in the presence to some sort of pesticide, it cannot will that mutation to occur. However, that if that mutation already exists in the population, then it can be used. All right, I have one last one. Mutations alone are usually inconsequential in changing allele frequencies at a particular gene. Now, if you combine a mutation with something like natural selection, or gene flow, or genetic drift, then the mutations become really important in driving evolution. But a mutation occurring by itself in a vacuum, so to speak, will usually have no effect in regards to evolution. It may affect the individual, but alone it will not affect evolution. There are three kinds of mutations I want to talk about. The first are point mutations. The second are chromosome mutations. And the third will be lateral, or sometimes we call them horizontal, gene transfers. Let's start with point mutations. So point mutations are a change, a single nucleotide of DNA. The change could be swapping it with a different kind of nucleotide, it could be deleting the nucleotide, or it could be adding a new nucleotide. At first, it might be hard to imagine how changing one nucleotide could impact an organism, let alone driving evolution. As a reference, let's think about humans. Humans have approximately three billion base pairs. And a base pair is just when two nucleotides bind to each other in the DNA. How could one out of three billion actually make a difference? So a good example of how point mutations can have a big impact on evolution, let's look at sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia occurs because of a mutation on the hemoglobin gene. This gene has about 1,600 base pairs. You don't need to remember how many base pairs are in the hemoglobin gene. Just telling you that so you can understand the perspective here. These are just three base pairs in that gene. And don't worry about what the letters are. You'll learn that later on. But you can see here that Going from a GAG to a GTG, only changing this one base pair here. So it's an A binding to a T in this base pair, and here it's a T binding to an A. Now you might not think that's a big difference, but it turns out it has a very consequential impact. Because of this change, it will produce a different RNA that only has one difference here. Again, an A gets changed to a U in the RNA. And the protein that results from this mutation is changed in only one amino acid, going from a glutamic acid to a valine. You don't need to remember glutamic acid or valine. What I want you to remember is that having just one nucleotide change causes one amino acid to change, but only one amino acid to change in this protein. This one change is what allows a red blood cell to go from being a circular flexible red blood cell to a sickle-shaped red blood cell. Just that one mutation. And that can lead to the disease known as sickle cell anemia. And we talked earlier in the semester how that one mutation that leads to sickle cell anemia, of course that is bad for the individual who has sickle cell anemia, but it can prevent that person from getting malaria, which has been a, an important evolutionary event that has occurred in African populations. Now, there are many types of mutations that we could look up and see how it has had an evolutionary impact upon a particular species, not just humans, as I showed in this example, but in bacteria, archaea, all kinds of eukaryotes. Mutations are important. Next, let's talk about chromosomal mutations. So let me draw a chromosome here. And I'm gonna just draw it very simplistically. And we haven't talked a lot about chromosomes, but what I'd like you to remember is that chromosomes contain genes. They will contain hundreds to thousands of genes. So gene A and gene B. With point mutations, we were talking about the impact of just one gene. So maybe this was the hemoglobin gene here. And that impacts that one gene. 
chromosomal mutations can have a much larger impact. Two specific chromosomal mutations that I want to talk about are duplications, and the other are translocations. Duplications are pretty much what you might think they are. It might result in this chromosome having genes A and B to now look like this, where gene B has been duplicated. So now there is an extra copy of gene B. So that would be a duplication. Now I did this very simplistically, just showing how one gene could be duplicated. But usually when a duplication happens, it duplicates a larger portion of the chromosome. And it will likely contain multiple genes that get duplicated. A translocation is a little different. So we'll still stick with our chromosome here with genes A and B on it, but we're going to add a new chromosome. For sake of argument, we can just say, you know, this is chromosome one and this is chromosome two. A translocation occurs when a part of one chromosome is moved to another chromosome. And so maybe in this example, we move gene A over to this chromosome and gene B will still be over here. In more extreme cases, you might translocate a whole chromosome. And so you may end up with a chromosome. So this is one example here, right? One example. Another example might be, as I was just about to say, you would move the whole chromosome over and you might end up with something like this, where now you have a single chromosome. Now, when you take genetics, you're gonna learn about the other kinds of chromosomal mutations and you're gonna learn about how they occur and you'll learn about how they can have impacts to the health of the organism. But I wanna tell you why these two particular ones have a role in evolution. So let's begin by talking about duplications. And as an example here, I'd like to talk about our good friend, the hemoglobin gene. We know that about 500 million years ago, there was a gene called myoglobin. And it had some of the abilities that our present day hemoglobin has in oxygen transport. And we still have myoglobin in humans and other animals. But what happened around 500 million years ago is that this gene, myoglobin, duplicated. So as I said before, it essentially just copied itself. And so there were two myoglobin genes. And I'm gonna just abbreviate that as MB. Now over time what happened was that one of these myoglobins acquired point mutations and eventually it started to have a new function. Similar function, but not the exact same. And that duplicated myoglobin now is this new gene called hemoglobin. And this actually happened several times to the point that in humans, we have many hemoglobin genes. We have hemoglobin genes that are now important when we're an embryo, others that are important when we're a fetus, and others that are important when we're an adult. But they all originated to this original myoglobin gene that existed 500 million years ago. And through the process of duplicating that gene multiple times and acquiring point mutations, we now have multiple hemoglobin genes that allow us to maximize oxygen transport at various stages of human development. Now it's not just humans that have multiple hemoglobin genes. Throughout this process of 500 million years ago to present day, some animals have all of these and some don't. And that has led to humans being able to evolve into what we are today. Next I want to talk about translocations. Again, we already talked about what they do. They transfer a part of one chromosome to another chromosome or they transfer a whole chromosome to another chromosome. So in talking about translocations, I want to talk about how translocations have been important in human evolution when we look at humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas. So to remind you, let's look at this evolutionary tree here, where we have humans here, chimpanzees here, and gorillas here. We'll talk about these trees later on in the semester and how to interpret them. But what we can see from this one is that humans and chimpanzees are more closely related because they had one common ancestor here, whereas humans and gorillas are not as closely related because they shared a common ancestor much earlier in evolution. But what happened here is a translocation event occurred after this common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans because we'll see this translocation event in humans. So let me write translocation of chromosome two. We see it in humans, but we don't see it in chimps and we don't see it in gorillas. Humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Chimps have 24 and gorillas have 24 pairs of chromosomes. That's because of this translocation event. So let me show you a picture of it. In humans, we have a single human chromosome two, but in chimpanzees and gorillas, but this one just is talking about chimpanzees, there are two chromosome twos. One's 2A and one's 2B. 
But when you combine these because of a translocation event, you get chromosome 2. And we know this occurred because the genes on 2A correspond to half of our chromosome 2, and the chromosomes on 2B from chimpanzees correspond to the other half of our chromosome 2. So this was a large-scale chromosomal event that happened as humans evolved, but it did not happen along the path of evolution for chimps or for gorillas. This has impacts on how genes are expressed and which genes get expressed, which are linked to why humans are human and why chimps are chimps. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about this last type of mutation. And that is lateral, or as I said before, sometimes we call them horizontal gene transfers. So let's begin with a definition. This is the transfer of genes from one species to another. Now this doesn't occur often, but it probably has occurred throughout evolution more than we used to think. So one way this could occur is if you had a eukaryotic cell, and draw it like this here, with its nucleus here that contains the DNA, and then I wanna draw a bacterial cell down here, which has its DNA in the cytoplasm. This eukaryotic cell could have engulfed this bacterial cell, and when this bacterial cell is engulfed into this eukaryotic cell, it would be degraded. And usually the DNA would also be degraded. But in some rarer cases, we see evidence that the DNA in the nucleus, now I'm gonna draw the nucleus just a little bit bigger so we can see what I'm talking about, has taken up some of the DNA from the bacteria. Now I said this was a bacteria down here, but it could have also been another kind of cell, like a fungal cell. It could also occur between one bacterial species and a different bacterial species. So there's a lot of different kinds of combination. In fact, that is one way we can get antibiotic resistant bacteria is through lateral gene transfer. So let's just make a short list here of examples. And the first one I'm gonna list is the one I just said, and that is we can get an antibiotic resistant bacteria. Another really interesting example is seen with the P aphid. Now pea aphids are a type of insect that will feed on the sap found in plants. An interesting thing about them is that they are brightly different colors, brightly red or brightly green. And usually when that happens it's because the organism, like we saw with the birds, acquire that pigment that makes them this bright color from the plants they eat. But the pea aphid, that is not why it is brightly red or brightly green. It's because of lateral gene transfer. It acquired a gene from a fungal plant that allowed it to be able to make its own colorful pigments. So these are two important examples of lateral and horizontal gene transfers. And now we've spent quite a bit of time talking about these four mechanisms of evolution. I'd like to take a little bit of time right now just to summarize their impacts on genetic variation and fitness. Natural selection, it can do a variety of things in regards to genetic variation. It can maintain it, it can increase, and it can also decrease genetic variation. When we think of genetic drift, this almost always decreases genetic variation. Gene flow, it can have different effects as well. It will usually either increase or decrease genetic variation. It increases it by introducing new alleles to a population, but it can also decrease genetic variation when those alleles leave one population to go to the other. Mutations, they always increase genetic variation. They are the source of new alleles. Okay, with fitness, I'm gonna come back to natural selection. I wanna talk about the others first. When it comes to fitness, genetic drift is random, but it usually reduces fitness because it reduces genetic variation. Gene flow is also random with respect to average fitness. However, unlike genetic drift, it may increase, decrease, or no effect. It depends on which alleles are moving from one population to another. One would predict if there's an increase in genetic variation, then that would increase fitness, or at least it could increase fitness. If there's a decrease in genetic variation, one might predict that it would decrease fitness. Wouldn't have to, but that might be a reasonable prediction. Mutations are also random when it comes to thinking about fitness. Most often, a mutation will be inconsequential. However, if it's in a coding region, it is likely to reduce fitness. When I say coding region, I should define what I mean by that. A coding region is a part of a gene that ultimately will make a protein. So not every piece of DNA will make 
proteins, but a coding portion will. So if that part is mutated, it is more likely to have a negative impact on fitness. Let's go back up here to natural selection. And this is the only one that is not random. Remember, when we talked about natural selection, we said there's a reason certain alleles are select because they provide some sort of adaptation. So it's not random because it selects for adaptations. If it was random, sometimes you would select for adaptations and sometimes you wouldn't. But natural selection selects for adaptations. It's the only one that selects for adaptations and it's the only one that's not random. Okay, that's all I have for this particular podcast. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me and ask some questions. If not, I will see you in class. Bye for now.